they started artificially infuse a certain amount of scarcity in my, into my life. So I can appreciate things more because abundance makes you appreciate things less. Well, thank you very much for coming. And uh, I've been told that um, if you want to have a successful marriage, you want to have low expectations. So build home, you know, you know, set high expectations. I want to lower them a little bit. Uh, so Saurabh Madan, my friend, was going to interview me today. And his you know, plane got delayed. And uh, my son was on a plane with me. And I said, well, why did you interview me? So, so, I, so this is my son, Jonah. He's uh, almost 22 years old. Uh, so he's, a, he's a junior at Sioux Border. And uh, he has some questions for me, and I haven't seen him. And I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure I, I'm sure I don't know the answers to those questions either. So we'll do about 20 minutes Q&A, and then maybe 15 minutes, you know, Q&A with you guys. So uh, go ahead. Hi, I'm, I'm Jonah. Um, I said that I'll do it, but the deal is you can't see the questions before. Um, so he doesn't know the questions or the answers yet. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's go to the first question. Um, one of my favorite quotes is, you like someone because, but you love them despite, right? And the idea is, if you uh, meet someone and you, know, you want to be friends with them and you like maybe their personality or certain attribute, you like because, right? But when you love someone and you're thinking about committing a lot of time to a person, you love them despite their flaws, right? And so when you look at investments, do you love or do you, oh, I'm sorry, do you like because or do you love despite? Wow. <laughs> I should have had Saurabh so interview me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as an investor, you basically want to make sure you don't fall in love with investing, with, with an investment, because you want to be as objective as possible. And you want to have an ability to change your mind when facts change. Um, because companies do change. Uh, and at some point, what you liked may no longer there. And so I would argue that as an investor, you want to be liking your companies, not loving them. So that's um, OK. I'll pivot a little bit. Um, so you have written two books about investing, and you recently wrote a book about life. And uh, one of my mentors in school uh, once told me that you should not focus on your resume, rather you should focus on your eulogy, right? And so when you wrote this book, do you think that was that pivotal moment for you where you realized that you maybe have uh, reached certain sort of um, accomplishments in your personal career, now it's time for you to give back a little bit. Yeah, uh, I think David Brooks wrote a book where he talked about focusing uh, not on your resume, but on your eulogy. Uh, so let me tell you, so the, my third book just came out a year ago. Uh, it's called Soul in a Game, The Art of a Meaningful Life. And the reason I wrote this, that book, was this. Um, I started writing in 2004. And when I started writing, I, I, I was hired by the street.com. And the street that come was looking for writers. They were not paying anything. And, and they, were, they were overpaying me because I was horrible. But little by little, I fell, I fell in love with writing. And my first, in the beginning, my articles in the, you know, were very, very dry. As I started to write more and more, actually, there's a very interesting story. So, so one of the most pivotal articles I ever wrote was in 2005, 2004, 2005. He was three or four years old. True story. So I was writing this article about TiVo. You know, if you guys remember, TiVo was this device. And I had a technical issues with that. And um, I called technical support. And as you, as you can tell, I have an accent. So when I called support, at the time, this was the early days of uh, automated recordings trying to understand your voice. And it struggled with my accent. So here's John at three years old sitting, playing with, with the truck. And I would, what I would do, I would give him the phone, and I said, tell them that. 
And so he would repeat what I said in a perfect Disney accent. And that's the only way the machine would understand me. So that was the whole article. So that, was, so, so that ended up being a 600-word article. And, um, and, and the number of emails I received in this article superseded 50 other articles I wrote before combined. And there was, no, there was no more insight in this article than any other article I wrote, except I was authentic, I was funny, you know, and I realized that there's, and this article changed the way I write. So over time, I started to introduce, uh, I started to write, uh, I, would, I would tell a story through bringing my kids, my wife, and, you know, uh, as characters into my articles. Then I started to write more and more articles about life. And uh, I accumulated uh, a lot of articles. And people, my readers, so I have a newsletter, and my, uh, and my readers would say, it would be nice if you aggregated these articles, put them into a book. And that's what I did. So Soul in a Game is basically a co collection of uh, life stories. And uh, so why did I do this? Well, the dedication of the book, Soul in a Game, is to my kids, because you don't read my emails. So I think that basically explains why I wrote the book. Okay. Um, so, okay, going along with the book, so you've, within it contains ideas from stoicism, investing, life, so on and so forth, but you've written this book, I'd say like probably over a year ago at this point, right? What's an idea, and hopefully you've learned about new concepts that intrigue you, that you wish you would have incorporated in the book, or you would consider adding into a future book? Uh, um, it's a great question. Um, I wrote this essay that I haven't published yet, yet about the value of scarcity. So when I, when I was grow up, growing up in Soviet Russia, my parents always struggled about you know, feeding us because the stores had empty shelves. And my mom always, you know, I remember staying in lines to buy eggs or to buy uh, meat. Uh, and uh, when we had ice cream, that was a big deal. Uh, I remember I had Pepsi for the first time when I was 16 years old. And that was like one of the most memorable days in my life because it was very hot and I had this incredibly magical drink. And I remember how phenomenal it was. And then we came to the United States and I discovered that you, buy, you can buy Pepsi in gallons. And over the next three years, I consumed more Pepsi than I consumed that I basically made up for the previous 18 years of my life. And I remember one day I was at the, at the restaurant ordering my third or fourth refill of Pepsi, and I realized I can't taste it anymore. It just tastes like water. And, and at this point, I realized I'm just, you know, I'm consuming these calories, a lot of sugar, and getting nothing for it. And so at this point, I decided I'm going to drink Pepsi or Coke just on very high occasions when I go to a movie theater, or et cetera. And after I started doing this, every single time I would drink Pepsi, I really I would, I would enjoy it. So if you think about it, we look at scarcity as a bad thing, as a society. And we look at, at abundance as a good thing. But I would argue that too much abundance is bad as well. And uh, like another example would be, you know, when, I came, when, when we came to the United States, we discovered that you can buy like tubs of ice cream, okay? And I remember we ate ice cream every day for, like we bought those tubs, very, very cheap, and we bought them and we ate them every single day. And maybe three weeks later, it just became just, uh, you know, it's, it tasted basically just uh, like ice and, and sugar. So we completely lost uh, appreciation, of, appreciation of ice cream. So, so I would argue that when you live in, a, you know, when we live in an abundance, you know, every single person in this room, I'm sure, has a lot more abundance than you know anybody who lived in, in Soviet Russia. So, but when you have abundance, you start appreciating things. Okay. So, what I started to do, I started artificially infuse a certain amount of scarcity in my, into my life so I can appreciate things more. Because if you, you know, again, abund abundance makes you appreciate things less. And um, I, I'll, I'll, give you, uh, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, so as I give you an example with Coke, I, I drink Coke or Pepsi just a few times a year and I appreciate it a lot more. I, uh, like on, thir on Thursdays, for instance, 
uh, I fast. And, and, and the, that fasting makes me appreciate <laughs> food a lot more as well. And uh, so there is a, you know, sto sto stoic, philosopher, stoic philosophers uh, force themselves, you know, uh, uh, force, uh, force themselves to, uh, uh, would, you know, do, do the, you know, we do uh, similar things. They would uh, uh, wear plain, cl plain clothes. They would, uh, they would fast again to appreciate things. And uh, so, one argument I would make is that you want to, you know, you want to infuse a certain amount of scarcity into your life to appreciate your life a little bit more. So that's so that's kind of that, that's the article. I was. That's that would have been that's a chapter the, of the book. Yeah, that's the idea. Well, you definitely drink uh, less coke than Warren Buffett. So. <laughs> that's very true. Um, okay, so you you spoke a little bit about being an immigrant, and I remember as a kid, I always grappled with the idea that my parents are immigrants because then I'm in this position where I'm in some of, of an in between, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not an American. Well, now I am technically, but I still have a lot of the cultural um, influences. You were, born, you were born. I was here. born here, so yes, I am an American, but. I have a lot of cultural influences from being Russian and American, so I felt like I was in this in-between, and it was something I used to struggle with a little bit as a kid. And I, one day I remember I asked you, I said, do you think that being an immigrant was a big advantage or disadvantage for you? And I remember your answer very clearly. But I want you to give it to everyone yeah, else. Yeah. So when, so I think that is a, so it's kind of interesting. When we came to the United States, I would have said that's a huge disadvantage. Yeah, there's a language barrier. There's cultural differences. Exactly. There's, yeah. yeah. But a few years after that, it becomes a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. And the reason, you know, the reason it becomes a huge advantage is this. You start seeing a contrast. As an immigrant growing up coming from a very poor country, with, you know, from a lot of scarcity, you see, you see the contrast between where you came from and what you could have. Yeah. And that contrast charges up your battery and ambition so much more than I would have, I would argue probably it's very difficult for like you know, for you for instance to have the same ambition I had, which is fine. I, you know, I'm, the reason I came to this country so so you, you have you, non unambitious kids. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, yeah. so we have so we have unambitious kids. Um, but actually, actually, I want to go back to the previous point I was making, and this mm -hmm. you know. The, the concept of scarcity, I'm going to go to scarcity. What's imp one thing, and I did this to you, you, know, to you when you're growing up. Yeah. You, know, you can talk about this. Um, I would, when we go to Chipotle, we would get a, you know, we would get a burrito and we would split it in half. Yeah. You know? Okay. And, uh, and even today, like when, uh, even today when, we, when you or uh, your sisters want to go to Starbucks, we don't go all the time. You know, we, there is, you know, there is a, we, because when we go to Starbucks, I want it to be a special event. Like when uh, I drive my daughters to school, uh, and once a month, not more than that, I get them a donuts. Okay, so the first day of the month, I get them donuts. If I got them donuts every day, they would not value it. But because we get it once a month, every, you know, when I get them donuts, they really appreciate it. So just things like that. That's, you know, those are the things I wanted to add to the previous thing. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. Um, okay. Let me, okay. All right, so you, you, uh, you talked a little bit about stoicism, um, and I think that over time it's become something that you've sort of really started to value, and I even started to value a little bit. I started reading a little bit about stoicism here and there, and I think one of the more interesting concepts is the dichotomy of control, and I think, you know, if you expand on that and then also apply sort of, or you explain sort of how you apply that to investing and then how you apply it to life, yeah. I think that'd be interesting. Yeah. So let me, before I talk about Stoic philosophy, let me explain what it is first. So Stoic philosophy, so when you see the word philosophy, you start thinking about dead, white, skinny white man, right? And, uh, and so it's, it's starting, it becomes very confusing and very intimidating. Well, Stoic philosophy, so, but the word philosophy just means love, love, love of wisdom. That's all it is. Um, and Stoic philosophers were basically philosophers uh, that lived 2,000 years ago in Rome and, uh, and Greece. And, uh, and there are th um, 
when I stumbled on it, what really attracted me to it was the, the economy of control. And, um, and uh, so Epictetus, who is one of the founding fathers, you can argue, of Stoic philosophy, you know, uh, he basically said, some things are up to us, some things aren't, okay? I know I just, you know, this is not the, the, the biggest insight you heard today. But if you think about this more, when then he explains what is up to us, up to us is our values our, and basically how we behave. Everything else is not up to us, okay? So when you are, when you are driving to work and you encounter a red light, okay, you can get angry, you can get frustrated, but you really shouldn't because it's not up to you if, the, you know, if you're gonna have a kid red light every single time. What's really up to you, how are you, you react to this? And once you realize this, that, you know, that you're gonna, you know, the fact that you encounter red light every single time, it's not up to you, then you're gonna change your behavior. And once you do this, the quality of your life will increase. Now, let's apply this to stock market for a second, okay? So there's a whole bunch of value investors as opposed in the room. What's really up to us is how we do research. As you guys know that when you buy a stock, you have no idea, you know, the market is gonna have an opinion on the stock every single day. And that's, that's you know, the way market, you know, the news is gonna come out every single day. And that is not up to you. Once you realize that, then you're gonna start focusing on improving your process, okay? And, you, and, uh, and, uh, and you're gonna focus your energy on the process and you're gonna stop paying attention. And uh, when the bad news comes out, or the stock goes down 20% or whatever, you really, once you realize it's not up to you, then you, you're just gonna let it go and it's gonna bother you less. And that's, that's basically, that's one application of uh, the academy of control. Uh, yeah, no, it's like, it's just, it's mainly like, I would say it's the idea that like, you only have control over the input, not the output. You're in the input business, right? That's right. Like what happens, happens, and at the end of the day, it's the processes that you establish that you rely on more than any output. That's right, you control the controllables, yes. Exactly. Um, so, okay, you've been interviewed many times and I'm certainly nowhere near one of the better um, sort of question askers, but I do have a question that is quite strange because you know many people will try to make you humble and say, what was the greatest mistake you've ever had in your investing career? Yeah. And you know, that's a very common question I would say. And what I'm gonna ask you is what is your greatest success? as an investor, <laughs> and I'm gonna put you on the spot. But I'm not asking that um, for you just to say what it is and we'll, to move forward. I'm gonna ask you, like, in, in that success, what did you learn and what do you carry every day with you from that? Yeah. So let me answer both questions, even though why well, you didn't ask. So I'll talk about failure and success, okay. that? Right. So let me talk about two failures and they're very different. Because when somebody like me what, you know, is asked about what's your biggest failure, you usually talk about the stock you made lost money on. And, uh, and that one is kind of self-evident. But uh, the one that my, if you look at my biggest failures is the stocks that are sold too soon. And let me give you a great example of that. Because think about it. When you lose money on the stock, the magnitude of your loss is 100%. When you sell a stock too soon, the magnitude of your loss could be multiples of that. So, and the reason I'm sharing that failure, not because, like, you know, I sold the stock, it went up, but I think there is a lesson in this. And this is why I wanna share this failure. So, in 2011, 2012, we bought Electronic Arts, you know, the company that makes video games. And at the time, the industry was going through transition. It was going from uh, where you would buy games in Best Buy, in pack, package games to downloads. And so what, if you looked at the company's revenue, they would look flat. But what's happening below the revenue line was the margins on selling digital content are much higher than you know, package, selling package goods, okay? But while we own the electronic cars, I think we bought it at $16, for the next year and a half, like every quarter there was some bad news happened and the stock declined to $13, we bought more. Then it went to 10, we didn't, because we were, at that point I was already exhausted. And then, I don't know, after ownership for a year and a half or two years, it declined first for a long time, and then it popped to $26 or $28. I did a little dance, 
I congratulated myself and sold the stock. Um, and then the stock went up to over hundred dollars. So, so here is the lesson here. When I look at this, uh, the, there's, it happened to many times that I sold the stock and went up higher. Okay, but this is a special case. And there is a special case. The reason I sold the stock because I was mentally exhausted. Okay, because while I owned it, it was such a painful experience. And I just wanted to close the ch chapter in my book. Okay, and that's why I sold it. Even though, if I looked at my original research, the, at, you know, when we, when we sold it, actually, the, the data actually got better. So the earnings were actually higher than we expected, etc. It's just, the, my ownership was very painful. So what I learned from this, sometimes you need to zoom out. Meaning when you own a stock the, and the, for a year and a half and it loses you money and the, you have bad news, even though fundamentally things are kind of working, you, time turns into kind of dog year, into dog years. And so at this time, it's very important to zoom out and, 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 and basically kind of don't do nothing. And, and that's going to exhaust you mentally a lot less. And then you're not going to do what I did. So, so because we basically lost four or five times, you know, we, we left a lot of money on the table. It could have been a, a 10x, but it became just a 2x. Uh, so that's a one lesson. That's one mistake. And then, and then I'm, just, I'm going to talk about another type of mistakes. I went back and re-examined most of my mistakes where we lost money, and we found one commonality between all of them. Companies had very um, uh, opaque f financials. You know, like uh, there was a lot of adjustments made to go from gap to non-gap, and that was or or the disclosures were very poor. I'm going to give you a book recommendation. Um, there's I just read this great book. I'm reading it a second time called uh, Lessons from the Financial Titan uh, Lessons from the Industrial Titans. It's written by three analysts, uh, three industrial analysts, uh, sell side analysts, and they are talking about uh, the, when one chapter. You know, they talk about General Electric, and they talk about how, as a sell side analyst, over the years became more and more difficult to analyze General Electric, and the, and the reason for that because they just. They started to, you know, the General Electric used more and more one-time items to meet and beat the earnings, and the quality of earnings has, has declined. And the point was, when the, you know, the disclosure got worse and worse, and because, you know, and the disclosures got worse because they wanted to hide things from you. Okay, uh, so now when I, whenever, I, whenever I stumble on a company who that has very opaque uh, financials you know that you know that you need to have a company's help to understand like non gap non gap help uh, we just go away we, you know we just stop we stop our analysis now let's talk about success and this success hasn't made us a lot of money yet but the uh, but I was pretty public about this um, so I'm a value investor okay uh, but one of our largest position today is Uber. Okay, and I wrote an article. I wrote a when we bought Uber, like a month before pandemic, which is probably not the right. Not in the hindsight, it was not the right time to buy Uber when you close down the economy. Before they close down the economy, I I literally got the it never happens to us. So I run an investment firm. When I bought Uber, I got five phone calls from clients saying. Is your daughter or son making investment decisions? Because <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you kidnapped? Because, and so I ended up writing, I ended up writing a 10 or 15 page research paper explaining why we bought Uber. Which is, by the way, you can look it up. But you, can, uh, Google, uh, you can go to my, my website. You can download it. And and then we held it through pandemic, bought more, and we bought more even you know, about a few, few months ago. And. The reason I'm very proud of this, and uh, because we bought it for the right reasons, when it was incredibly hated stock, it looked like a stock that value investors should not own, and I would argue we should own. You know, and I, in, in, in a, and I saw what other people did, and uh, so and now it seems to be showing up little by little in the numbers, and so that's so that's the one where 
That's we, the we, one where you loved despite. Yeah, yeah. yes, right. yeah, yeah, so that's... Okay. Yeah. Um, Nietzsche wrote that if you stare into the abyss too long, you'll become the abyss. Okay. How often do you look at your portfolio? Uh, <laughs> so I used to look at it I used to look at it like many, many times a day. Now there are days where I forget to look at it. And um, I would argue it's the, you should want, you know, like ideally you want to look at it uh, once a week. Uh, ideally, when you look at it once a week or less. Um, because if you think about it, when you look at stock prices every day, most of what you see is noise. You see, you, what you see is volatility. There is very little information in this. But the problem is, when you do this all the time, it shrinks your time horizon. When, when you're analyzing like companies and you build discounted cash flow models, I don't think anybody built discount, discounted cash flow models for 60 days, right? When you do, it just doesn't work, right? So you, you're looking at 5 or 10 or 15 years out, or at least, I would, I probably 10 to 20 years out. However, the stock market shrinks that to days. So the less you look at the, your portfolio, the better your performance is going to be. Okay. Um, <coughs> what is something that people wouldn't know about you unless you told them? It could be your routine. It could be any interests. I think the people are always surprised how much I write, and the, and like when do you have time to write? Um, and you know this very well. So I write. I get up at about five o'clock every day, and I write for two hours a day. If you think about it, that's seven hundred hours a year. Okay, so when you do this, you know, a little bit every day, two hours a day, every day, then you end up writing a lot. So I think this is probably uh, what people, you know. Well, let me see, okay. let's, let's do one more question and let's go to the audience. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, for the last question, I have learned a lot from you, being your son, and it's been a roller coaster <laughs> of an experience, but it's, I'm very grateful. Um, because I have someone very close to me that I can actually like, like when people ask me who my role model is, like I say my dad, and I'm not trying to say that to be, like I think most people in my position wouldn't say that. Um, but um, so because I've learned a lot from you, what is something that you learned from your father that you tried to instill in me? So it's kind of interesting. Uh, after I wrote about Stoic philosophy, people ask, start to ask me, you know, when, so what happens when you, Bob knows this very well, you write a book, you do a lot of interviews, and people start asking questions about this stuff. Somebody asked me a question if my father was a Stoic, and I never thought about this because my father never even knew what, you know, Stoic philosophers were. And, that, and that in Russian, there is a song, and the words are, my father would repeat me those words all the time. The weather, the nature does not have bad weather. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, I'm loosely translated from Russian, sorry. Uh, so whenever we go outside, and like I grew up in Murmansk, Russia, which is, uh, if you think about the most northern tip of Norway, right there. So it's very cold, long winters, very, you know. And uh, my father would always, you know, whenever, whenever it was very cold outside, or it was raining or snowing, etc., and he would always tell me this. And because if you think about the academy of control, you really have no control over weather, right? All you can do is either you can, um, you can either accept it, and then you actually can find beauty in this. Actually, uh, Sam Harris has this beautiful quote. It's a lot easier to change the way you look at the world than to change the world. Think about it. You can make yourself so much happy if you just change your person, you know, how you look at the world. So I think the, my, uh, your grandfather uh, probably taught me kind of, you know, he introduced me to stoicism you know, when I was very little. Just neither of us knew about that. So, <laughs> so yeah. Anyways, uh, let's, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. Um, so you, you mentioned about, uh, I think it was EA. Was that? Yeah, sure. Uh, 
Um, so you mentioned about um, EA that y you should have, there should be, maybe you should have done more inaction, but I would be very curious to, to understand um, about reviewing your positions. So, because those, that there's a bit of a tension between those two things, right? Leaving things be and then reviewing them on a regular basis. Do, do you regular review quarterly or what's your process for that? Yeah, so we, 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 we review our stocks at least quarterly. At least because every quarter we, if you want, if you're an American company, so it's every quarter, if you're European, you get a data uh, every six months. Uh, uh, you, you know, at, le at least quarterly. And uh, we are looking basically just have anything changed, have this has changed. In case of the, like, the difference with the A was the earnings were going up, the digital was growing much, you know, even much faster than even I expected. And uh, we just, when I, when, I was, when, I, when I was selling it, I was willing to accept 10 times earnings. And, and I knew the earnings probably higher than that. And, but I just, I already kind of wanted to give up on it. It's just, you know, just I wanted to say I made money and I don't want to deal with it anymore. But we, you know, we, do, you know, we, do, review, we do review it quarterly. And one thing we do at the, at the end of each uh, at the end of each conference call, we are, you know we we write questions. What do you want to see in the next conference call? Okay, so that's you know what you know that's yeah, that's one thing we do. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, o Oliver Müller. I'm originally from Germany, but now live in Mauritius. Um, we know that uh, a lot of successful investors other than investing have another strong passion, like for example, Warren Buffett likes bridge. And if I'm not mistaken, for you it's classical music. And I was just wondering if you could talk about what it is that you derive from classical music, which helps you in your investing success. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So you, you love, so it's kind of funny, because people ask me this question all the time. And when you ask this question, love you enough, you start trying to justify it backwards. I love it because it helps me invest. I love it because I love it. Okay, so, the, <laughs> but I, what I do, so what I do, and that, all right, so let me answer it this way. In, this is, you know, this is gonna touch on him, it's gonna be very funny. So in 19, uh, when he was born in 2001, uh, this was early days of internet. And I remember reading the headline or uh, something, and you, you may remember this, that if your kids listen to classic, to Mozart, then they'll become brilliant. Okay, do you remember this, this was the study? And, and that's, I, this was the early days of internet, so I didn't really do much research. Okay, so when my wife was, when he, uh, was pregnant with Jonah, and, you know, uh, she, we bought her a belt that had a speaker and a CD player attached to it, and she would walk around the house, and, uh, and we would play, you know, play Mozart's music. So he listened to classical music in the negative you know, age, um, and uh, and we would play you know, Mozart's music, you know, uh, throughout, you know, throughout the house, etc. And then, actually, a few years ago, I actually read that study, you know, and uh, and that study basically said this: that the guy who conducted the study. He just loved Mozart. <laughs> the thing is, he, he, could have had, he could have had a love for ACDC or Led Zeppelin, and then it would have been Led Zeppelin effect, okay? Not Mozart effect. So he would be listening to Led Zeppelin in his negative age. Uh, but the study, what basically found is this. When, when, you listen, when you listen to music while you create, it connects your left brain and right brain, so it boosts your creativity. That effect goes away a few minutes after you stop listening. So it doesn't, so, so it did not make him, you know, he's a smart kid, but not because of that. Um, but, there's certain buts, okay? Number one, they found that when you listen to music that has words, that actually may reduce your creativity because your brain starts trying to, you know, to interpret the words. Um, they also, they found that some music, some people are, like, for instance, I can't, when I, when I write, I have my headphones on, and I listen to music, but I, I usually don't listen to violin concertos because it just doesn't agree with my writing, okay? So I listen to operas, even though it has words, but I don't speak Italian, so it doesn't bother me. Uh, 
<laughs> okay, uh, so it's a, it's, what I'm trying to say is this, it's a very personal experience. Okay, some people, it may work for some people, it doesn't work, it may not work for others. And you just get a, you know, play with it and see, you know, uh, what it does for you. But overall, when you listen to music, it helps your, you know, it does help your creativity. So, yeah. if, if I could quickly, yeah. I have a different theory. Um, I believe that classical music attracts a certain type of person, and maybe that type of person might have a, maybe, a higher level of intelligence, right? And then their genes get passed on, right? <laughs> and then they just, the circle continues. Yeah. So that's my theory. Yeah, yeah right there. Uh, Robert Hagstrom, I really enjoyed your book, The Sideways Market, and uh, thought it was really well done. So my question to you is, what do you think the probabilities are that we may be in for a sideways market? Well, Robert, thank you so much. I, so Robert wrote a great book about Warren Buffett, one of the first books about Buffett I read. So I think, <laughs> um, okay, so, Let me just, take, I can, this is, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked me this question. Okay, so I'm gonna try to, sum, you know, to, uh, to explain the concept first. So if you, look at the, if you look at the stock market history over the last hundreds of years, what you find that we had a, usually two type of markets. The markets were, the bull markets, markets went up for a long period of time. I'm talking about, you know, 10, 15 year periods. Okay, this, think about from 1982 to 2000. 18 years, I forget, 15% return from the stock market. And then you have a market that's not really a bear market, but it's a sideways market. What does it mean? It's a basically the, the long-term trajectory of the market is flat. It's, you know, it really doesn't, doesn't go anywhere, but you have a lot of volatility. You have a lot of mini bull markets and bear markets inside of it. You may have a two-year bull market and you know, six-month bear market, whatever. Now, why does it happen? Think about returns for stock prices. Well, no, for stocks first. Return for stocks come from two sources. Uh, dividends and price appreciation. Okay, put dividends aside for a second. Look at stock appreciation. Mathematically, I can explain you performance of any stock over any period of time just by looking at two numbers. What happened, looking at beginning price to earnings ratio, ending price to earnings ratio, and earnings growth. It's just, it's like the EMC square of, of a, of a stock market. Earnings growth plus change in price to earnings, that's how, that's, that's how you can explain what is happening, you know, this is how you can project returns for stocks in the long run. Or you can, how expl you can explain what happened to them in the past. Now, at the end of bull markets, what happens? The price to earnings is very high, and so as price to earnings declines, that the decline of price to earnings cancels out earnings growth. And therefore, you get, you know, the, the earnings, oh, just one more thing. If you look historically at our economic growth between sideways markets and bull markets, it was, the real economic growth was very similar. Okay, so the biggest, the biggest factor difference was really just starting valuations. So valuations were very high as they declined. The decline in price earnings detracted from, uh, det uh, detracted from returns. Now, I wrote my, uh, this, uh, I wrote this, the little book of service markets was based on my active value investing, which I started writing in 2005. Um, and uh, when I wrote the little book of service markets in 2010, my art, you know, I still believe we were in the, in the midst of a uh, sideways market because in 2000, you know, our valuation of S&P 500 was were very, very high. And historically, price earnings went from above average, through average, and the state below average for a long period of time. And uh, the reason they stayed ever below average for the first long period of time because it takes a while for people to say, I don't want to own stocks anymore and give up on stocks, and that's what causes the end of the service markets. However, what was different that time is that we had interest rates go to zero or negative, and that changed that part of it, okay? So the sideways market never really completed itself, it just went to kind of a new phase of bull market, except what, uh, except what happened. So if you, look at the, if you look at the stocks now today, if you normalized for profit margins, 
the, the valuations are very high. And, and I would argue, because if you look at the corporate profits today, the uh, profit margins today like 11.5%, average over the previous 20 years were maybe like seven and a half. So, and I would argue corporate profit margins will decline for a couple of reasons. Number one, we're gonna have, uh, high, we have high interest rates. Number two, we have deglobalization, where globalization was helpful to profit margins. Deglobalization is gonna be negative for profit margins. And I think number three, because we have a lot more, uh, a lot more debt in the economy. So, I you know like I'm short on time, but the, so my point today, you know, my point is that my, the little book of service market is actually more relevant today than when, it was, when I wrote it, because we are, valuations are extremely high. And as valuations you know, contract, you basically, you know, if, you own, if you buy stock market indexes today, for the next 10, 15 years, you basically are gonna experience a lot of volatility and no returns. So that's, you know, that's, thanks a lot for this question. So. Well, join me in thanking uh, Vitaly and his son, Jonas. Thank you very much. Have some seats. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you.